So hello everyone, this is Pui Hamami, Senior Healthcare Analyst at Edison Group, and we're pleased today to have Dr. Stephen Gourlay, CEO of Actigen, Actinogen Medical, with us today to discuss the company's latest developments. Stephen, welcome to Edison TV. Uh, thanks for having me. That's great. So please let us understand a, a bit about the company's core product, Xanamem, and how it works and what its mechanism of action is with regards to targeting to cortisol and how that differs from other approaches currently used to treat memory loss and Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, sure. Happy to explain. So the first thing to understand is that this is a once a day low dose pill. So it's not like an infusion every couple of weeks with an antibody to say amyloid, which is the approach the larger companies have taken for the last, well, really two decades. And so we are targeting an enzyme that uh, it synthesizes a hormone called cortisol, which is known to be toxic and associated with shrinkage of key areas of the brain, such as the hippocampus, uh, in association with memory loss and, and you know, steady progression of Alzheimer's disease. So if you like, our molecule is the first of its type to get into the brain in adequate concentrations to test what we call a cortisol hypothesis. In other words, that can you, if you can control or normalize the brain levels of cortisol, uh, can you actually stop the disease in its tracks? And some new data that we have, which I'll talk about later, no doubt, uh, suggests maybe we have. Okay, good. Well, actually leading up to that is, uh, I mean, if we look back at some of the history of some of your recent data, um, now th there was an initial study from called Xanadu phase two in patients with Alzheimer's disease a couple of years ago, which did not show a statistical effect on the disease. But recently, you reported some very promising effects in those patients from the study who have been actually shown to have clinical evidence of the disease through blood biomarker testing. So please elaborate a bit on this recent development and how, and how differentiating for patients who have elevated P-tau biomarker readings can perhaps show a differentiated treatment effect, such as on the CDRSB scale. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, the, the company has created a lot of clinical data. And one of those trials is the one you mentioned, Xanadu. It was 185 people with clinically diagnosed dementia, but there was no confirmation that they actually had Alzheimer's disease because uh, while that's the commonest cause of dementia, nearly a third of patients with dementia have strokes or frontotemporal dementia or other types of dementia. And those patients typically don't progress during a short tri trial like the 12 weeks used in this trial. So what we did was we went back and we're able uh, with modern blood sample uh, techniques that are available in 2022, but not previously, uh, to select, to find patients who still had stored blood samples from that original trial, which was negative in the original analysis, and choose the patients who have real Alzheimer's disease likely to progress with by measuring this one called phosphatau or PTAL in the blood. And what we saw is the patients with the higher PTALs indeed did progress in the placebo group, but they didn't progress uh, very much at all, if, or if at all, in the Xanamem group, suggesting that the drug, once it starts, uh, once you start taking it, it works quickly and it can actually prevent and possibly fully prevent progression of the disease. And thus, we do hope, and it seems to be true, that the drug is disease modifying, or at least disease course modifying. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that the, you know, we talked about the CDRSB scale. Uh, what exactly does that scale measure and, and how relevant is, is it for assessing Alzheimer's disease and, and drug candidates like Xenomab? Uh, yeah, so the, the endpoints you use in, in testing in trials of dementia are terribly important because if you have patients with very mild memory impairment, you have to use sensitive instruments for that very mild memory loss. Similarly, if you have people who are quite severe in a nursing home, you have to, you can't use those instruments, you have to use different ones. So the CDR summer boxes is an 18 point scale designed to measure how people function really. So it uses things like home and hobbies, memory, orientation, community. So you, you get scored on a scale of zero to, to three on each of those scales. So it's a measure of how well someone's functioning. And so that's one thing. And then we measure how pe well people think and that's called cognition, and that's another type of test. So what we saw in our study of, uh, of the reanalysis of Xanadu in patients with Alzheimer's disease is that we saw a big effect on CDR summer boxes over a short period of time, just 12 weeks. And that was due to the, the drug stopping 
patients from deteriorating compared to placebo. But we also saw improvement in cognition in that trial as well. So two, at least two separate ways of thinking about is the drug working. Okay. And, and so now I, I imagine that the company's next step really would be to try to build upon this. And so, I mean, based on these biomarker results, I believe that the company is planning another, well, a phase 2B study in patients with, with mild Alzheimer's disease. Please let us know a little bit more about the study and when you plan to start enrollment. Uh, yep, yeah, indeed, we are planning that study. Uh, the design is pretty much complete. Uh, the primary endpoint will be the CDR sum of boxes that we saw such a strong effect on. It's an endpoint that the FDA has approved for a Biogen uh, amyloid antibody called Algehelm last year and uh, is almost universally used in late stage clinical trials in the field. So it's quite uncontroversial. But importantly, we do want to demonstrate the good effects on the drug helping people solve problems and think and remember things more clearly. So we will be using a number of different cognitive endpoints as well. It will be a six month trial and it will start in the first half of next year. And hopefully we'll get results as early as late 2024. Okay. And and what would be the next steps for, you know, for Xanaman if results from this next study actually do confirm the efficacy findings that you've shown in the biomarker data? Um, what, could, what could we then see as the next you know, developments? Yeah, so we're, we're very confident of a positive result in this study because the new analysis of the previous study called Xanadu really shows, it's really pre-running the clinical trial in the same patients with the same endpoints and selecting the patients in the same way with PTAL. So it's a very strong trial or pilot, if you like, of the real trial. So um, we are planning to talk to the FDA and the European regulator relatively soon and talk to them about the design and get their agreement on the final design and endpoints to be used in our trials. This new phase 2B will be one of a potential two or three approvable trials. So we will be using our to be marketed formulation. So um, we hope to start a second pivotal trial as early as late next year. Uh, so in other words, what we're trying to do is fairly aggressively bring forward the day we can bring this, uh, this drug to patients because we believe it's so important. Absolutely. And, and you know, relating to Alzheimer's and, and a lot of uh, very challenging progressive medical diseases is the term disease modification. I think you mentioned it earlier. Um, now, the biomarker-specific Xenadu study showed some very positive effect on cognitive impairment on the scale, the CDRSV scale. But what do we know about whether Xanamim can actually have a disease-modifying effect that has changed the course of the disease? Yeah, so look, it's a great question. So to be fair, in this analysis of a 12-week study, you only get limited information about disease modification. I think what we can say, by preventing patients' progression on CDR summer boxes and on this cognitive test battery, we're at least changing the course of the disease. So longer trials will be required to show that you actually have a durable effect and really significantly alter the long-term disease. In other words, become truly disease modifying. But the animal work suggests it is disease modifying because you can actually protect against cognitive decline for a 13 month period in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. So the initial data that we're showing now are quite encouraging that it'll be disease modifying. Now we have shown in two previous trials that it is a, what we call a cognitive enhancer. And that means that within two to four weeks of taking the drug, people have, are able to focus, uh, have pay more attention and, and their working memory, so-called, which is an important part of ability to think uh, is improved. So we think the drug is both a cognitive enhancer and a modifier of the underlying disease. Well, I mean, uh, when it comes to Alzheimer's drug therapeutics, uh, many listeners are aware of amyloid beta and the amyloid beta hypothesis and, you know, with drugs like Aduhelm and the Canabab that are targeting amyloid beta. Now, Xanamam, of course, having a, a significantly different approach and also being a fairly convenient to take uh, one daily oral drug with, a, again, with a different mechanism of action. So how do you see the drug fitting into clinical usage settings if it becomes approved? Do you, do you anticipate it could actually be used alongside other drugs that are being currently treated, used to treat Alzheimer's disease? Uh, as a safe once a day oral drug, it's a very convenient and safe therapy to use in combination with any other drug. So including in older people, people on high blood pressure pills and diabetes medication, other things, it's a very safe drug to use. So it's a perfect drug for combinations. But for Alzheimer's disease, 
I think what we believe right now is that when we get the drug approved, it will have a, a, a larger effect than the amyl anti-amyloid antibody infusions, and um, and therefore and be much more convenient. So those uh, those infusions for lecanemab, for example, it's once every two weeks you have to go in and get an intravenous infusion. Uh, there is a side effect of of uh, brain swelling that occurs, and not commonly, but but it still can be fatal. And so, if our drug has a higher, much higher clinical effect uh, to stop disease progression and is much more convenient and safe, I don't think it's going to be a very difficult decision for patients and doctors to make to choose our therapy ahead of those anti-amyloid antibodies. And look, for the field, we hope that some other drugs that are being investigated, uh, other small molecules and other antibodies do turn out to have good efficacy. But at this stage, we are the only company with a non-amyloid mechanism drug that has really credible and interesting cognitive data. In this, in our case, three separate clinical trials showing positive data. And and looking at, at the market effectively and, and the current pricing of Alzheimer's disease therapies that are currently out there, if the if Xanamem is successful and it reaches all the next steps for clinical uh, approval, how valuable do you think the drug could be in this type of market? Look, I mean the the last pricing event in Alzheimer's was the Adjuhelm priced initially at fifty six thousand dollars. That was the first amyloid antibody. People are talking now of the new one maybe being $20,000. Uh, and if our drug is twice as effective as that and more convenient and more safe, I mean, from a value-based pricing perspective, from for the, for the company, you could argue that it should be priced at a similar level. Um, now, most people would say a small molecule pill typically because costs are lower for production, you would, you would price it lower than that. But uh, any way you cut it, basically, a highly successful oral therapy for Alzheimer's disease is a multi-billion dollar exercise, arguably into the tens of billions of dollars, and it could be the most successful drug ever. So, um, you know, it's a very valuable asset, and at this stage, we've taken a lot of risk out of the program, so we are super excited to uh, move quickly into the next series of clinical trials. And Stephen, I think you touched earlier on the on the fact that Xenam has also shown positive effects on human cognition in, in two other studies, basically in healthy adults. And I think that's the uh, Xenam study in Xenamia Part A. I mean, looking at these studies, um, this kind of can lead into your your next indication because it's not just Alzheimer's that, that this, you think the drug can have a benefit. I think you're also looking at um, patients with uh, mild well with cognitive impairment due to major depressive disorder. Um, so does this uh, affect unhealthy adults, perhaps give you some confidence in, in, in that second indication perhaps as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. One of the reasons we chose depression as our second indication is that we had previously shown strong and very highly similar effects on attention and working memory in two independent trials. And that gave us uh, a strong belief that we we could de-risk the depression program because our primary endpoint in that study is cognition. The secondary endpoint will be the treatment of depression itself. Now, there is a good rationale based on cortisol and a few drugs that have actually inhibited the cortisol system over the years that you can treat depression as well as cognition. So because cognitive impairment is so common in depression, uh, using our therapy to treat both depression and cognitive impairment could be a really, really good approach. So we are doing a proof of concept study of about 160 individuals uh, as add-on to existing therapy. Uh, and that study will start this year and hopefully read out by the end of next year or early next, early 2024. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this is very helpful for, reader, for our listeners because I think many are very familiar with Alzheimer's disease and medical need in that area. But maybe there's less awareness in terms of depression and cognitive impairment as it relates to that. Um, so maybe you can just give us some ideas. How, how big is the market for cognitive disorder as it relates to depression? And what, I mean, are there any treatments that actually do um, provide some cognitive benefit in patients with depression right now as it stands? Yeah, so as Pretty much everybody knows, I think, you know, depression is a very common thing. I think it's a one in seven lifetime incidence of depression. Uh, and it's uh, most patients with depression have that uh, degree of foggy thinking. 
and it doesn't always get better when the antidepressants such as the first line things like the SSRI drugs are used. And so there is a, a gap in the market, if you like, where the, there are some antidepressants, they, are, they work okay, but they don't really treat the cognitive impairment terribly well. Uh, Lundbeck developed a drug called Vordioxetine or Trintelix, which is on the market, and that does uh, have in its label description of clinical trials uh, with a positive antidepressant control showing that it improved cognition as well. And so based on the, the global sales of that, that molecule, which are 500 million US a, a year, you know, we believe that an antidepressant that has some positive benefits in cognition it has a significant, not well, it's quite a large niche market, if you like, and that, uh, you know, but we, were, we are going further than that. We're going to explore whether this drug can actually treat depression and cognitive impairment at the same time and work faster and more effectively than uh, alternative antidepressants. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we've talked a lot about um, Xanamib's efficacy to date and how it might even help with the cognitive impairment and depression and Alzheimer's. But the, the drug has also been studied, as you said, in, in now in three placebo-controlled human studies. And that must give you a lot of data on you know, other aspects, such as safety. So what do we know so far about you know, long-term safety with regards to Xanamib? Yeah, so safety is incredibly important. And so you know, we're very pleased that we've safely treated more than 300 people at this stage. Uh, quite a few of them for 12 weeks. So we haven't treated beyond 12 weeks, so that safety remains to be established in the next series of clinical trials. But we have a good deal of confidence that it, the safety profile is excellent. So really, in in the largest tr trial we did, the 185 patients with mild AD, uh, we saw very low rates of things such as headache and fatigue, um, a little bit more in placebo sometimes, a little bit more in Xanamem, but essentially no signal of anything that we are concerned about. Very good, very exciting. I mean, and looking at clinical trials of themselves and Alzheimer's disease, you know, that these are obviously very costly endeavors, costly, costly studies. And if you look at the company's current profile, how do you see your, your, your cash runway with regards to the upcoming studies? And um, are there any strategies that you're looking at to potentially to support the investment of ZMM in these you know, very strong indications? Uh, yeah, so um, at the end of the, the September quarter, we had 17 million in cash, including a receivable, and that puts us in a great position with, you know, more than 12 months of cash. And we're with the, and we are able to do the trials a lot cheaper than, say, a US-based company might, because we're doing a lot of the work uh, in Australia that attracts a 44% uh, tax credit as cash from the Australian government. Plus, we have uh, our own internal clinical trials uh, team that uh, can avoid paying exorbitant prices for, for contract research organizations globally, which is a very expensive way to do trials. So, so we are efficient, capital efficient in our operations. Uh, we also have a benefit from the R&D tax credit. Uh, and eventually, we will need, of course, uh, additional funds, but we are looking to see whether we can do a regional partnership uh, to basically for example, expand the clinical trial program locally in Southeast Asia or China. Uh, that would be a way to bring in some non-dilutive funding and help to fund the clinical trials as well. So we have lots of options when it comes to funding and um, we are in a nice position with a decent cash balance such that we don't need to consider a rapid or bad deal in the short term. That's very reassuring for, for investors. And if you look at the whole profile with Tenogen, uh, Obviously, we've really discussed this, the, you know, the promising indications of Alzheimer's and cognitive impairment and depression. What would you say would be the, some of the major catalysts that we should see for the company and for Xanamin over the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, so we have a lot of news flow planned, um, and that comes from running, of course, two parallel programs, one in Alzheimer's disease and one in depression. But in addition, we have a backlog of peer-reviewed publications that will come out, um, including our PET scan study, which is the important data showing that we have high levels of target engagement in the human brain. Uh, that will be coming out shortly. We'll be publishing that original uh, Xanadu mild Alzheimer's study with these new data showing that the drug indeed works when patients have got high PTAL. Uh, we'll have a number of scientific presentations we're presenting at the uh, CTAD Alzheimer's conference in November. 
Uh, we'll be presenting at other conferences throughout 2023 and 2024. And uh, we'll be interacting with the regulators and, you know, we'll be announcing, you know, a series of hopefully uh, good news as we get their agreement on various different ways to bring forward the date we can get this drug approved. Now, I, now I should say, I should add just uh, yeah, the, yeah. Clinic, the big clinical trial results are potentially end of 23, early 24 for depression and late 24 for uh, the, the Alzheimer's disease phase 2B. Did you plan it to provide any interim data for the next, uh, for the phase 2B Alzheimer's study? Uh, we haven't fully finalized the, the design of that and interim analyses are always something people consider, but because the trial is probably going to be very popular and will enroll rapidly, it's fairly unlikely an interim analysis would work because the problem with an interim analysis is if you're enrolling very fast in the second half of the trial, you know, particularly in a six month trial, by the time you get the data analyzed for your interim analysis, you've enrolled every patient. So uh, we probably won't do an interim analysis now. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Stephen, for, for, for joining us and for really introducing the viewers to really a potentially exciting development for the treatment of Alzheimer's and other cognitive disorders. Very, very interesting data out of um, Zanamem that you recently released in the biomarker study. So uh, we look forward to having further updates in the future. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.